Hello, welcome to Thursday Garden Chat, which is the weekly free broadcast run by Garden Masterclass. Our normal business is putting on day workshops led by garden and landscape experts across Great Britain and Ireland, and increasingly on the European mainland as well. Since the pandemic, however, we have gone global. We have started doing online broadcasts. Uh, a lot of these are pay-to-view webinars, which we do with uh, garden and landscape experts from all over the world to our global audience. However, this event is our Thursday Garden Chat, which is a pro bono. It's a free event, which we put on every Thursday for an hour with somebody who is a gardener. It could be a head gardener, a botanist, um, a, a garden historian, a photographer, a designer, a huge range of, of people we talk to. And these are recorded and they go up on our YouTube channel uh, and we keep them there for a couple of months. Uh, the best content then goes to our members channel. But at any one time, we've got something up to 100 hours of free, really interesting garden viewing on YouTube. Now, we do this for free and we would really appreciate donations to help with our running costs and you can do this with the donate button which you can find on the online page of our website. Just to say I'm delighted to have a fellow graduate, uh, postgraduate um, fellow from Sheffield University tonight. Uh, Annie, do you want to introduce him? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yes, so tonight we are, it's very exciting. We've, we've ventured across to Kurdistan and I have to say, hands up, I had to have a good old study of the Atlas today, which I've done. Uh, don't test me on all the borders, but I, I pretty much know where we are. Um, and so we have, our, our guest tonight is, is, um, Hamid Abdullah, but we also have Jenny Spears here tonight from uh, the Lemon Tree Trust. So hello, Jenny. Um, and before I introduce Hamid, um, I'm sure those of you who've joined us before, you, you will know that the Lemon Tree Trust is our, um, our charity that we use, or we use, we donate from our friends, any of our friends events. We've, we've, <coughs> we've actually had a good chat with, with Jenny and Hamid uh, before, and that's on YouTube. So you can see that, and that's a sort of general information about the Lemon Tree Trust. Um, but any of our friends events, um, then we ask for donations to the Lemon Tree Trust. So in the chat box, I have put a link, which is our Just Giving link to the Lemon Tree Trust. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know about the Lemon Tree Trust, you are going to hear about it and you will, you will discover more. It's an extraordinary organisation doing wonderful things. So, um, Hamid, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight um, because you are a couple of hours ahead of us and I know you've got small children and it's a tricky time of night for anyone with small children. Right. <laughs> so, so thank you so much for, 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 oh, all um, right. for okay. joining us. It, it's, all it's right. Great great to see All you. All right, yeah. Um, and Hamid, before before you start, because just to explain to people, um, mm -hmm. also, if people want to ask questions, please do. So you can ask questions in the chat box if you want to just type it in and we'll relay the questions. If you particularly want to speak, then if you you can um, put uh, your hand up by using the the little symbols in the in the chat box or on, on your Zoom screen um, and, and you can you can chat. You know, that's not a problem. Um, you know, that that would be lovely. So but if you just want to type a question in, please feel free. Um, Jenny, who is based in Bristol, is going to be running the slideshow and Hamid is in Kurdistan and he's going to be talking. So just so that you know how, how the logistics are working and that's how we're, we're setting it up. So Hamid, welcome. And, and you're going to do a little bit of background about yourself before you start. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I am Hamid Mohammad Shwani. I'm from Kurdistan, northern of Iraq. Kurdistan is situated in a mountainous area, which is on a border of Iraq, Iran, and Turkey. Um, the area is quite rich in a sort of plant and, you know, sort of scenery and landscape. So today I've been hosted by garden master classes which i do really thank them for having this great opportunity it's our pleasure <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah um if we just start within the slides yeah uh, we can see on the screen which is 
Iraq is particularly in the middle of the map now, and Kurdistan is located in on the northern part of Iraq. So let me just give you sort of concise background of landscape in Kurdistan region. Kurdistan region is rich in history of biodiversity and plants. So not just in the Middle East, but in the entire world. Despite of its richness, little is known about the diversity of plant life here. So still there are so many species which is nobody knows what they are in the mountains. It's not been registered. So if you just uh, look this scenery, it's exactly Sakran Mountain, which is ne is not next to, but is near from the border of Iraq, Iran. So this has been for a while of, I mean, influenced by a war between Iraq and Iran for eight years, which started 1980 to 1988. But now all freed and people can, can use this scenery to go picnic. Um, just, I want to just talk about the environment of Kurdistan region. Basically, the environment here is, has faced threats from all the sides. So if we think about the sides, it would be climatical change, which is not here, all, all around the world, entire the world. But here, the weather get warmer and warmer. It's all because of the um, increasing, uh, sorry, decreasing the plant species and, you know, the green stuff in, in, in Kurdistan. So another threat would be political crisis during Saddam regime and afterwards. So this is such as a 30-year-old minefield left, left from the Iran-Iraq war and ongoing military activity along the border. That means all the fauna and flora, let's say the, green, the greenery or the, the plants have been endangered for a while. So if we look at the slide on the screen, it is Korok Mountain anyway. And the town which is just next to the mountain is called Rwandas. The, the scenery is, is, is amazing, it's beautiful, but still needs to be recovered. Um, if we talk about landscape history in Kurdistan region, so for a thousand years, farmers in Kurdistan, a region in northern Iraq, have cultivated the wealth of native groups that spread throughout the world. The traditional garden design of Kurdistan is more naturalistic sort of design aspect. This means water trees, grasses, and flower beds can be seen the most. Nowadays, I mean, recently, we've introduced botanical garden as well, which is becoming a multi-purpose garden in contrast to traditional gardens or parks. However, it's almost absent in a whole of Middle East countries so far, but we've, we've started to, to introduce this type of landscape. Um, yeah. That's the valley of Kaulok, which is rich in plant biodiversity. As you see the water stream, the, the, the river, which is next to the, the village, and behind of the, the village is um, Handran Mountain, which is one of the famous mountains in Kurdistan region. So, people still conserve 
the, the environment here, but it needs to be taken care more about it. I mean, um, planting more trees, planting more green stuff to recover the landscape, um, and at the same time, support wildlife. <clears throat> um, let's just go through my insight of personal love for plants and landscape design. Basically, um, I did my bachelor degree in horticulture, which I graduated 2009. Then I had sort of love for plants. Um, after that, for two years, I became assistant lecturer at Salahadin University in Erbil. And still, I did some research on plants. So when I finished these two years of becoming assistant lecturer at the University of Salahadin, I was... You know, I, I had a keen of studying higher degree in, in, in planting, you know, science. So I decided to study landscape architecture. Well, so this is the point that I had left to, to, to start my passion for plants. So as I said, love for plants is... This is my, my ambitions and uses them to create round structure in the garden design. So my ability is to identify and draw out of a, a sense of places and something that gives a garden particular quality uh, of harmony and belonging. So when I decided to study higher degree, I mean master in landscape architecture, I chose Sheffield. So choosing Sheffield University was the influence of both James Hitchmore and Nigel Dunnett, which they were amazing. And I can, you know, these two persons, I cannot forget in my entire life because they have a wide experience of theory and practice in contemporary planting design in Europe, North America, and Australia. And these two persons are leading academic researchers in the field of new sustainable landscape design, plantings and designs. So, as I said, I started studying master and that took me a while to finish my master. Fortunately, I graduated from Sheffield University 2016. So that was my study in the UK. Um, when I came back to Kurdistan, I decided to work on my field of study to my work on my career so at the end of, at the end of 2016 I started work in humanitarian section in Iraq because once I came back I saw lots of IDPs and refugees in my country particularly in my region Kurdistan region of Iraq so was the end of 2016 I applied and I became a deputy camp manager in one of the IDP camps in Iraq. Then I thought I worked basically for nearly two years with refugees and IDPs. And then I thought to develop of my knowledge in the field of landscape design. So I must have worked in that field and I applied for a landscape lecturer at the University of Salahadin, M. Salahadin University. And I accepted, I was accepting that time. Here, I should have combined both humanitarian assistance and landscape design perspective together. So 
one day I met Lemon Tree Trust team in Kurdistan region. They came to Hersham IDP camp and I talked to them. I introduced myself to them. Well, that was my keen to work with them to combine these two aspects, as I mentioned earlier. Now I am a Lemon Tree Trust horticulture and landscape design consultant. I do works with them. Basically, I have a vision for future landscape design in Kurdistan region. If you just next uh, go to the next slide, Jenny, yeah. So once I combine these two aspects, humanitarian assistance and landscape design, I visited some of home gardens. So in the picture, you see one of the one of a particular home garden design in Kurdistan region. Well, once once I came back and I, I met these people and their gardens, I could have seen some new plants. However, we used to have some plants before which is not available now what we can we can call them endangered species i i i, I believe i w might be somewhere but i haven't seen it since i came back so roses you you can see everywhere this could be like a traditional flower species in my in my country and trees grasses shrubs all native species and urban species um so i met some of the guard gardeners in my country and talked talk to, to them about you know sort of planting and the techniques of plantings and the difference between the traditional and the new techniques of plantings basically all the gardeners still use traditional way of gardening of garden techniques um i had a chance to arrange a session for nearly 200 gardeners in 2019 i'm in 2019 so we had workshops we had sorts of trainings and uh, i show them the most new techniques the, the newest techniques i mean in, in gardening and in landscape design and sort of differences between the landscape design styles uh, because we've been sort of influenced by persian gardens and roman gardens so we are a bit hygiene and hybrid between these two landscape styles so if you just go to the next uh, slide, Jenny, thank you. Yeah. So this is a public park, public green space in my country. When you go to the, the, the landscapes, the parks, the, the, the green, the greeneries, you can see some statues, which are symbols for different different let's say um different uh, stages of our past so this statue is exactly about a new era for kurdistan for kurdish people and the independence um a bit of let's talk a bit of political situation in my country as I said, in the past, in, in, in before 1990, I mean, during Saddam regime, we've been be right alive as a Kurdish people from Northern Iraq. We've been displaced. We've been under different sort of regimes, sort of new, 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 new rules of having a dependent nation rather than having an independent nation. So 
Kurdish forces, Kurdish authorities decided to have the independency in 2017. So on 26, on 25th of September 2017, we conducted independency. We all voted for yes for ind independency for Kurdistan. But still, we have sort of autonomous autonomy in, in the Kurdistan region, but we are still under central government of Iraq. Um, so the statues, as I said, you can see in the parks, all about freedom as we, we, are, we are dreaming. Yeah, Jenny, if you just go to the next slide, please. Yeah, um, we talked about landscape. Uh, let's talk about the, 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 the cities and the urban places in Kurdistan. I live in Erbil, which is capital of Kurdistan region of Iraq. It is quite a mega city and it is all about skyscrapers, hardscapes. Landscape is here, but it's not in that sort of limit which has been dedicated by, 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 by the entire of the nations or entire of the countries in the world. This is the skyline of Erbil. You might see sort of fog layers just above the, the skyscrapers. But during the lockdown last year, all these fogs just cleared and we, we, we saw like a clear sky, a clear blue sky without any any pollutants, without any fogs, but unfortunately just started after the lockdown. So this means we still need more landscape and gardens to purify the air and to 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 have a better lifestyle in the region. So um, my vision for the future of landscape design in Kurdistan region is fighting climate change. So that's the, that will be the first point of my vision. As I said, climate change have been in have been affected the environment of Kurdistan region, particularly the the, the cities. So, if we don't fight the climate change, we're going to face a bigger problem. And the second point of my vision will be helping communities adapt to changing the world and bringing artful and sustainable parks and opening spaces to every community, rich or poor, to recover. Communities in Kurdistan region is quite diverse. In this case, if we want to bring the communities together, we need to have more parks, more green spaces. So preserving cultural landscape heritages and sustaining all forms of life in the region needs to be recovered as well. So I, I think we might have more slides if Jenny go to next or yeah so this is the mountains of Kurdistan region which is all about trees and you know the the plant species the plant species which some of them or a number of them has not been uh, I think we've got a a comment by one of the participants let's Yes. Do, do you do you want to answer it now, Hamid, or do you want to wait? Um, let, let let me finish. Let me finish yeah. the the the, the, yeah. the slides, and and then we're gonna we're gonna be back to to yeah. the to the questions. All Absolutely. right. Absolutely. No worries. Right. Yeah. yeah. So this is quite rich in terms of plantings, but still we need we need to recover because lots of the fields is being mined and still is not being like. Um, evacuated by the mining 
forces in Kurdistan region. If we have more slides, go to please, uh, Jenny. Yeah, this is our bill too. So as I said, um, green stuff will be seen somewhere, but I've applied sort of um, the paperwork is to the Ministry of uh, Scientific and Higher Education to plan our cities with more green stuff, with more gardens and parks, because uh, I think it was last year, before quarantine time, before lockdown, yeah, it was last year, 2020, it's, at the beginning of 2020, um, uh, we did a survey in uh, our cities and asked people about how how uh, how they convenience about the green stuff. Population in in herbal, particularly asking for for more trees and for more gardens. Uh, as the, the 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 climate of the city, I mean the microclimate of the cities, in in a dangerous situation nowadays. Uh, yeah, Jenny, if you just go to the next slide. Yeah, here you go. That's the Lemon Tree Trust um, link and the, the Facebook, Twitter, and, and Instagram web page. Thank you all for listening to my talk and let's listen to the you questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Hamid. Um, no worries, Annie. Yeah. <laughs> that one question that came up to start with was, um, right. you mentioned the sculpture as symbolic of freedom. Are, uh -huh. are there plantings that also signify freedom? So is, are there people expressing that in a landscape uh, format in any way? Right, yeah. Um, yes, we introduce a juglanus trees, which is called nut trees, as a symbol of freedom. Mm -hmm. Because in Saddam Hussein regime time, around 2,000 trees being cut down at the northern part of, of, of Iraq and Kurdistan region, mm -hmm. just, just to lead people to leave their, their um, areas and go to the cities. I mean, just not to have sort of agriculture, not to have, not to be in support. Um, that, that's their thought in that time. That was their thought in that time, not to support Peshmerga forces, but leave their the less um, um, spaces and shelters and all being moved to the cities. That's why we called and we symbolize that trees as a symbolic of freedom. Mm. Yeah. And Hamid, you said that you you've been lecturing for you know on and off and, and still and still lecturing. Are right. there what's the I mean what is the take up of courses in horticulture and landscape design in Kurdistan? How how uh, you know popular is it as a as a as a career is is there a demand for it are, are right people, you know what what do the young people and the older people feel about right doing yeah. that as a, as a career you know right okay um landscape design career in my country is quite new i mean in my region is quite new once i applied for landscape design people thought i mean my 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 friends and and, and my university mates so they thought that could be quite new if you applied when you came back you might not be like hired by by the companies and by by the buddies but when i came back fortunately i i i saw loads of you know new parks in 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 a in a modern design by by tech companies by by european companies so one of the newest park in in the city where i live is peshmerga park Mm -hmm. which is totally new and all the, 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 the design has been by like a, a, a foreign companies. So it means people have passion for landscape design, but 
in terms of graduated people, we are we are quite just a number of 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 graduated, you know, students from this field. But was about three months ago, I had a meeting with um, Salahadin University president, and we 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 suggested to have sort of not a college for that, but a independent department for just a landscape design mm -hmm. because we have landscape design as a module at the university, but not just like an independent field of study. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And could you, there are a couple, few more questions which we'll go on to, but could you just explain a little bit more about what the Lemon Tree Trust does? Because there might be some people right. who don't know, and also okay. how you work with the Lemon Tree Trust. So right. sort of firstly about what they do, and then, okay. then your role. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, Lemon Tree Trust is a non-profitable organisation in Kurdistan, region of Iraq. We do work within IDPs and refugee camps across the Kurdistan region. Basically, I've joined them at the beginning of this year, 2021. So I do support the team in the team of Lamentary Trusts in Kurdistan region of Iraq. We do support gardeners within a sessions, within a lectures, within a sort of supporting them in a, um, let's say, um, sort of defining new strategy, new approaches of landscape or agriculture or horticulture. Mm -hmm. And just to, to, to have more, um, gar not gardens, let's say a greeneries in, in, in um, camps either refugee or IDPs, and supporting wildlife and biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's interesting. Um, Pat has a question of, do you know how many people have been displaced over the years? And is there any likelihood that people can go back and return to their homeland? Right. With, you know, what, the, what right. is the likelihood of that? Yeah. Um, during my work within a humanitarian section in Kurdistan region. Uh, since 2012 and to up to now, let's say, more than a million of IDPs and refugees, you know, just flee to Kurdistan region. Mm -hmm. And all have been settled in a different camps. Mm -hmm. That starts from Erbil, Suleimani, the Hawk. I believe we have 28, 28, yeah, we have 28 um, IDP camps plus 14 uh, refugee camps. Right. Uh, right. But the exact number of IDPs and refugees, I mean, if we just let's sort of them in, in two ways, I don't know the exact number of them, but uh, more than a million. More than right. a million people, right. yeah. Right. And in and in, do the are the camps all the same size, or do they vary in size? And and if so, what? How many people are are, are living in in one right? Area? Yeah, camps are varied in in different uh, in different sizes. And in terms of sizes, we have a smallest camp, which is called Harsham IDP camp in 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 uh, Erbil, and the biggest camp is Dummies one and two, which is more than 70,000, uh, uh, let's say, people mm -hmm. live in that camp. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be about more than 20, 20 something thousand families. Yeah, yeah. And what proportion, I mean, you may not, may not be able to answer this, but what proportion of the people living in the camps will have had gardens or would have been growing f food vegetables fruit before so do you do you have a feel for how many people horticulture right. is a new thing mm -hmm. or is it something mm -hmm. that they've lost in their old life really right okay um in terms of having gardens in the camps the the proportion couldn't be precise but 
could be around 15 to 20 to 25 Mm percent and people are to this field of you know field of green and landscape is not new because before fleeing to to Kurdistan region there were farmers in their countries and once I talked to them they had I mean they still have a great experience in horticulture and and landscape so that means they've been trained they've been experienced by 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 horticulture and landscape Mm -hmm. in their homeland Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the garden few few questions coming Mm -hmm. up about right about native plants of the area um and you were saying about how uh, the flora of Kurdistan has never really been properly documented, which you know I can I can well believe. There was one man I think who I, I'm not sure whether he ever went through Iraqi Kurdistan, but he certainly did through the Iranian and, and Turkish Kurdish regions. Right. One character called Jim Archibald, who died probably about ten years ago. Um, mm. I don't know whether any of the of our listeners have ever have any, had any dealings with Jim, but he was a right. Scottish botanist who had an incredible knowledge of the flora of the whole region. And he would go off with his wife every summer seed collecting. Um, and he'd travel around by bus, live very simply, and right. then sell these seed collections at, at the end of the year, which kind of boosts mostly to specialist growers. Now, in fact, a certain number, I think, to, to Dutch bulb growers who know that mm-hmm. read them. I mean, he, he, right. really, he really showed us what an extraordinarily rich flora there was. And also exactly. Was yeah. An enormous amount of, you know, each valley would have its own kind of variation of particular tulip or, or, or narcissus species. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I would sort of quiz him about his travels because he was really the most best travel man I, I ever met. And he'd every now and again just make some comment about the, I don't know, the complete lack of religiosity of the Iranians, for example. And right. It would really surprise you. And he'd quiz him. And mm-hmm. he, he never seemed to have any sort of, usually people who travel a lot have incredible stories. And he never did. Nothing bad ever happened to him. He never, mm-hmm. he never got locked up as a spy or any of the things that I know happened to other people who've travelled in Central right. Asia. Very sadly, of course, being a seed collector, he spent a lot of time bent, bent over like this and ended up with a terrible skin cancer on the back oh, of his neck, yeah. which eventually killed him. Oh, um, and oh it no. Sort of tragic end for, for somebody mm, who had so, so much... Uh, for understanding the biodiversity of that whole region. Um, it was sort right. of like we're coming on to, you know, you do have an incredible flora, and I think several of us would be interested to know what, you know, when you do start able to developing public gardens or indeed private gardens that might start using some of that native flora, um, whether that's something that it particularly interests you or, or whether there's other people in, in the country who would be interested in, starting this process which is quite an involved one of, of because what's growing wild doesn't always necessarily take so well to, to cultivation right i mean recently about 46 species of plants has been documented and rec- um, recognized by the scientists um one of the species i can remember is Asperanthia asmerica, which is from Asmer Mountain next to Suleimania. Mm. Um, I talked to, once when I was in Sheffield, I talked to James and I said that there is a great opportunity in Kurdistan region for, for you know, discovering new species of plants. Mm. 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 We've planned basically in that time, but due to ISIS, uh, crisis, ISIS, you know, sort of war in that time, and uh, we 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 didn't have that much time. To, I mean, James, not me, because I came back in that time anyway. But mm-hmm. he had no no chance to to come to Kurdistan and to discover the the plant species. Mm-hmm. But still, there are so many species not being discovered. Mm-hmm. So many species. Actually, one that. Um... Are you familiar with Flomus russelliana, that yellow flower? Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, it's, uh, certainly that comes from Rojava, um, the bo- quite a Rojava. small area. And, yeah. I mean, this is an amazing plant. I always call it the roundabout plant because it's the sort of thing you can plant on a local authority roundabout. To, yeah. You, know, you can appreciate it at 50 miles an hour 
365 days of the year, a really good plant, but it has absolutely no genetic diversity whatsoever. You know, we desperately need somebody to go out, do some more seed collecting to kind of widen that, that gene pool. But of course, you know, mm. not exactly the best place to go seed collecting at, at the moment. Right. But I'm sure James Hitchmore, you know, once things settle down, he'll be he'll be out there. I mean, the man is. Pretty well, uh, he, he told me that he's been to Iran and particularly mm. the border of Iraq, Iraq, yes. Iran. Uh, and he, he has already discovered some species was not being not being registered yet. Really? Yeah, but yeah. I believe if 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 he come he, he come to Kurdistan, he, he would find more, more, more species. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Um, Maggie's asking, uh, w which plants did you love when you were in Sheffield that you don't see in Kurdistan? And I suppose that you probably can't grow in Kurdistan. Was, it, was there anything that you particularly fell Right. In well, I still remember one day with my wife and my, my children visited uh, Sheffield Parks, one of the Sheffield Parks. Let me just think what was the exact... Um, yeah, Sheffield Botanical Garden. Mm -hmm. We saw snowdrops. I just I sort of told my wife, what sort of plant is that? So I've never <laughs> seen it. Um, so that was that was quite new for me. So and, and I met snowdrops first time in, in Sheffield. But when I came back and one day we had a picnic to Hulgurt Mountain, I saw the same species of snowdrops, but you know, not cultivated in, in urban yeah. urban yeah, yeah, places. Yeah. How yeah. wonderful. How wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that is fantastic. And what is the situation there at the moment regarding COVID, Hamid? How how are things how are things, you know, with with you know life at the moment? Right. Um about a week ago the cases surged. I mean the the the, the COVID cases surged and government announcing some regulations uh, we do sort of half half lockdown not not like totally lockdown mm -hmm. so now i think the cases going to stable and minimize so mm -hmm. i hope within the next two months people can vaccinate themselves and the the, the, the situation gets better mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I know on, on the Lemon Tree Trust website, there is a there's a little profile, a question and answer session with you, which is rather lovely. And and it okay. was, you know, what what's your dream for the future? And it was to is to open a botanical garden. So Right. Um Okay. Just describe <laughs> describe <laughs> right. describe As, what what right. that would be like. Your your this is your dream botanical garden. T tell us yeah. what it was. Yeah. As I said, botanical garden is quite new type of landscape in my region mm -hmm. and my dream is to to establish a botanical garden which would be better and um let's say bigger than what we have at the moment because we have sort of little botanical gardens which is we we can call a botanical garden but it's not not that big to be to be mentioned basically uh, the reason why i dream why i have a dream of having botanical garden is to keep all the species in the botanical garden because we have some species which is endangered at the moment mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah 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 fantastic and um wendy is asking wendy's in america is asking in the camps do you will you concentrate on food crops or flower crops or a mixture Right, right. We have mixture of of flower crop, flower and 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 let's say vegetable and and uh, additable in plantings. Basically, for um, uh, not field crops, but for for crops that we can we can have a daily. I mean, people would 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 love to have a daily. Uh, we we we. We concentrate and and we 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 emphasize on that species that people wanted to have it with their meals, such as malochia, which refugees love love, love these sort of you know plants, and uh, we do have nearly all over the camps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Wonderful, wonderful. And um, I mean, Jenny, you might like to to say something about this, which was something that I I found that was surprising but lovely is that you that you have sort of competitions, garden competitions, throughout the camps and and I guess inter camp competitions. Um, do you want to just sort of talk about that? Because I just think that's such a such a you know a fun thing to do. Absolutely. Um, well, that's really how Lemon Tree Trust started. Um, people are in both IDP and refugee camps, but particularly refugee camps, um, there are already gardens there. You know, people are people are kind of start gardens fairly quickly when they when they move in. Mm -hmm. um, lots of people bring seeds and cuttings with them from home um, to kind of ready put in the ground. So the, the idea of the competitions was really to encourage more of that. The camps themselves, as you might imagine, are, are pretty barren places. They're built on pieces of land that the government, the local authorities can't use. Um, Dom is one camp, which, um, which Hamid mentioned and is where most of our, you know, our, our sort of team is based, if you like, that's our sort of hub and our community garden hub. That's built on an old military base, Saddam Hussein's military base. So it's, the land is, is pretty poor. Wow. Um, so, you know, you have this huge conurbation of people, people packed in right next door to each other. I think Dom is one, there's, there's two camps kind of right next door, Dom is one, Dom is two. Dom is one covers an area. Am I right, Hamid, in saying it's about two kilometers square, isn't it? It's not very big. I, I believe, yeah, because all the families are just... Yeah, so in two kilometers yeah. square, you've got 32,000 people. And so it's so dense. And yet, you know, what you need in that area are trees and gardens to kind of, you know, to, mm. to improve the environment, to kind of give people shade. And, and so the competitions was really a kind of idea that our founder, Stephanie, had to encourage people to start creating home gardens, to start planting trees at their shelter, to try and green the camp, to try and create this kind of microclimate that might mitigate some of the, the, the soil degradation. De, de, degradation. Degradation, yes, can't say that word. Um, and, and the pollution, because inevitably, you know, cars and trucks are piling through these camps pretty regularly. Um, and from those competitions, that's how the sort of community garden idea started, mm -hmm. because obviously people want to come together and garden together. And the women that garden in our community garden in Don is One, many of them said to us, until they found the garden, until they kind of had the opportunity to garden there, they hadn't yet socialised with other women. They weren't able to leave their shelters to kind of socialise in a group. Men tend to have, and this is particularly with a sort of Syrian culture, but men tend to have shisha bars or, or coffee bars or, or places that they can go to socialize but women it's not a culture of of, a, of of offering places for women to gather as as a group like that so our garden does offer that and um, women come together to take tea for breakfast there's a community bread oven there where women come they bring their own fuel we give them flour they make bread for the entire community every day um, and so COVID has kind of stopped a lot of that, obviously. We've had to cut back on some mm -hmm. of that um, sort of social stuff. <laughs> but the competitions is, is kind of, it's got people, it gets people excited every year about gardens again. And, mm. and it's something to look forward to because, of course, again, when people are displaced and <clears throat> obviously to start with, you want the emergency stuff, you want the shelter, you want the healthcare, you want the food and you want to make sure people, sure people have water and sanitation. But once you realise that you're here to stay for at least the next 10 years, you know, and more, and the average time someone spends in a camp is 20 years, wow. um, you want more than just a sort of roof over your head. You want, you want to create some beauty around you and you mm. want to feel like you're putting down some roots. So that's really the idea behind the gardens. And going back to Wendy's um, question about um, food crops or flowers, one of the things that Hamed is going to help us do is show people that, I mean, people are growing both already, of course, you know, food for, for everyday use, herbs, salad crops in particular, and Molokia is totally mm -hmm. lovely. I had never had it before, but it is so, so nice. Um, it's like a sort of spinach, but it's meatier than a spinach. And you kind of, there's this, there's this dish that is cooked with 
with um, lots of garlic and chicken and malachia. Oh, it's so good. Different but, um, recipes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but flowers offer the opportunity for increased biodiversity. So it's only through planting a mixture of flower crops that we're going to sort of increase the biodiversity in the camps. We're going to encourage in the sort of beneficial pollinators, um, other wildlife, and that's how we're going to get some more some diversity back. So what Hamid's doing is he won't, well, he's doing lots of things, but one of his, one of the things I think this is right, Hamid, yeah. that you're going to do for us is create a kind of um, urban, urban planting mix, a sort of perennial planting mm -hmm. mix that is specific for a camp environment. So when people say to us, well, okay, we've got this bit of land next to our shelter. What do you want us to grow? Or what can we grow that would be useful? We can say to them, well, here are the seeds, this is what you know these this is the mix that we would love to you to, to grow Hamid can help kind of design that that mix and we want to create these little pockets of perennial planting that will come again year after year and add to the biodiversity of the of the, of the camps mm -hmm. um Anna's asking great project addressing so many divergent aspects have you approached a tv company to further <laughs> the awareness <laughs> and demonstrate the model for take up elsewhere Oh, thank you. That's that's kind of I, I've got a several hats that I wear, but one of my hats, or one of the main hat I suppose I wear for Lemon Tree Trust is communication. So definitely, I think a, t a TV. I mean, it's kind of um, it, it would be brilliant, wouldn't it, to to sort of be able to show this as a series or as a one-off documentary. And mm -hmm. other documentaries, of course, have been made about the refugee crisis. Um, uh, very very successfully and I think that was certainly something we would want to do in the future mm. um, I think we're very aware that um, there are lots of mixed feelings about um, displaced people and in our work you know we try and stay quite under the radar that sounds a bit strange but people are, are surveyed a lot they're asked questions a lot they're visited a lot you know how do you feel about this how do you feel about that you know mm -hmm. so what in our work what we've tried to do is 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 steer away from uh, asking too much of people, if you like. Mm. And I think when you start getting a, a TV uh, yeah. company involved, when that becomes a kind of a thing, um, it can be quite intrusive. And I definitely think that's something that we'd want to do in future. But I think we've got some work to do first, just kind of establishing some really good, sustainable year on year projects that we can demonstrate really, really well mm. that are helping a, a, a wider variety of people in the region. So I think from our perspective, we still feel there's quite a lot to do before we kind of, um, you know, kind of talk about it in that sort of way but of course we're gathering photos and we're gathering you know um bits of film along the way and we've tried to show a few films that we've we've made of people in their own words you know gardeners in the camps and you can you can see those on the stories um section of our website if you're interested yeah, yeah. And in fact, I mean, I became aware of the Lemon Tree Trust at Chelsea Flower Show because you've had two gardens at Chelsea, haven't you? Two? Or we one? had one one garden at Chelsea in 2018. Tom Massey oh, designed yeah. that garden. It was yeah. at the very top of Main Avenue. Yeah. Um, and then we did a fundraiser in 2019. Right, okay. yeah, so we yeah. came back to Chelsea in 2019, but that was just a, a kind of fundraiser. Yeah, and I remember that there was a there was a film where Tom went to a camp. You know, they they actually took Tom over, and and so there was a little bit of an insight at that point. But that's when my first. So that was a good. Uh, that's a, a very good uh, example of how a charity um, can raise awareness by being at somewhere like Chelsea. Um, it was and brilliant, and it was mm -hmm. and and we you know we went into Chelsea thinking that we would have lots of questions from people about you know well why why flowers you mm -hmm. know if you like. The idea of, of people growing food is, is an obvious one um, to kind of sustain your family or to add fresh um, food to your diet. But we weren't quite sure how people would react to this idea that we were supporting people to grow flowers. Mm. But obviously we got there and just about everybody, just about every visitor at Chelsea immediately understood, of course you would want to grow flowers. If I were in that position, if, if I found myself in that kind of environment, it would be one of the first things you would do. You would put some, at least some sunflower seeds in the ground or yeah. you would definitely have a rose. Yeah. So uh, we were, we had a, such a brilliant, brilliant experience at Chelsea. We were, we were blown away by the comments and that really kickstarted a sort of more, um, you know, a sort of acceleration really in, in what we were trying to do. And, and, and we really expanded the, the competitions after that. Mm, yeah. 
Okay. Well, that, that's, that's been wonderful. I don't know if anybody else has, has any last questions as we're coming, coming up to the hour um, quite, quite, uh, quite quickly. Um, and I just want to say, Hamid, thank you so much for, for giving Thanks, up. Thanks, Annie. Well, not only an hour of your time this evening, but putting together the talk. Thank you. And, thank you. Thank you so um, much. And if people want to know a little bit more about the Lemon Tree Trust, we have we have a talk on YouTube. And in fact, we do have yeah. um, the founder as well um, talking about it because she was there that evening. It was a lovely it was a lovely talk. Um, and so please do and um, please do try and give a little bit of money. I, I mean, a little bit of money goes a long way. A packet of seeds goes a long way. So, um, you know, the, the, the website details are up there. Our link is in the chat box. But um, yeah, please do if you can. I know um, it's it's hard, but um, yeah, I think it's. Yeah, it's no, that's great. They were great. Thank you great so great much to great. Max. Yeah, great. thank you so much, Annie and Noel and God Masterclass. You've raised so much money already for us. It's absolutely fantastic. So wow. um, thank you very much for all you're doing. No, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you. All the best. Okay, so thank okay. you very much, everyone. Thank Thanks, you, Mom, Annie. Thank, thank you, you Noel. All right. Have Stay a great touch. time. Okay, yeah. take care. Thanks, Bye. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye.